Co-op Professionals Group. They were first formed in 2014. This is a group of experts in the field of law and finance who may not be formed as cooperative businesses, but they are all well versed in the laws and regulations of the operations of the many cooperative sectors. So in short, they came together to work across the co-op sectors and discuss how to advance the, the movements. The group's inaugural conference was a success, and we are in the process of planning a follow-up conference in November of 2015 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, the group is also extending their outreach to cooperative professionals in the field of human resources. You can check back on the ncba.coop website uh, for some more details in the coming weeks and months. So this is the first webinar we are hosting with them, and it will certainly not be the last. Uh, before we begin, however, I just have a little bit of housekeeping for you. Participant phone lines will all be muted during this presentation to reduce background noise. Uh, so feel free to flush toilets and order coffee and let dogs bark and babies cry. We will not be able to hear you, uh, so that's uh, a good thing. Um, there will be a chance, however, to pose questions. Uh, all you need to do is make sure that you have GoToWebinar pulled up on your screen and you can type messages into the question box. When time allows, we will get to those questions and our panel will be able to discuss them. Uh, we are also, as I mentioned, recording this program and it will be archived on our website. Uh, you will receive an email containing the link to the posted recording early next week. So you'll be able to listen to it again and share it with friends and colleagues and whoever else might be of interest. Um, so our panelists today are Linda Phillips and Jason Weiner. Uh, I'm going to turn the uh, webinar over to Jason first to introduce himself and then to Linda, and then they will begin the webinar. So without further ado, uh, Jason, uh, take it away. Thank you, Brian, and thanks to all of you who are joining us uh, this morning, afternoon, to learn about the creative application of the cooperative business model. My name is Jason Weiner. I am the principal attorney of my own practice, Jason Weiner PC. Uh, my practice is organized as a public benefit corporation and is Colorado's first public benefit corporation to become a certified B Corp. My practice specializes in cooperative and social enterprise law, focus on regenerative and sustainable economies through socially responsible capitalization and financing provide outside counsel services for all types of businesses, many different industries, and many different practice areas. I'm excited to be with you all today and look forward to a great discussion. Linda. Thank you, Jason. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. And I wanted to send a special thank you to the National Cooperative Business Association for sponsoring this webinar. Um, they're very important in the cooperative business community, and I think they do really great work. Uh, my name is Linda Phillips. I'm the owner of Phillips Law Offices. I'm a sole proprietor. I've been working with cooperatives for over 20 years, uh, starting first as a paralegal and then becoming a lawyer. I decided I liked it so much I'd go ahead and get that piece of paper. Um, I work with all different kinds of cooperatives and all different times, kinds of businesses. Uh, advising them on everything from real estate and employment law to how to form the business and um, how to uh, create a, a great cooperative business. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of the Cooperative Professionals Association with Jason uh, and with Thomas Beckett and the NTBA, and I'm also a, a member on the board of directors of the Rocky Mountain Employee Ownership Center. And that's all about me. So today, we are going to look at uh, co-op models and how they will be applied to 10 industries. Uh, what I wanted everybody to come away with today is not a nuts and bolts description of how to form a co-op. Uh, we found that there are lots of co-op development centers around the country in various states that are very, very good at providing information on how to draft bylaws, how to uh, develop a business plan, that type of thing. What we'd like to do today is mostly describe uh, and open your minds to uh, all the different industries that are available to the co-op as a business model. 
Uh, we will be looking at the types of different cooperatives for different in industrial sectors. In other words, um, do you want your business to be a worker co-op? Depending on your industry, do you want to be a marketing co-op or a producer co-op, et cetera? We will look at the pros and cons of having only one class of members uh, or having uh, a hybrid co-op with multiple membership classes. And uh, we're hoping that, that this discussion will open you to thinking about co-ops in various uh, industries. Jason, you're up. We wanted to start with uh, some, a basic framework to look at some key concepts that uh, we'll want to think about in each of the examples. And as Linda said, this is really to inspire creative thought around the cooperative business model. Uh, we're excited to be witnessing a resurgence of interest and uh, innovation in the cooperative space. And we thought that these concepts should carry through in each of the examples. As Linda already mentioned, we're going to look at the single class versus multi-stakeholder class structure of different cooperatives. Uh, when might one versus the other be a better fit uh, at a structural level? We'll look at different types of cooperatives, again, consumer, producer, marketing cooperatives, hybrids. Important in every example is the degree to which and the way in which a cooperative capitalizes itself and what are the financing options available to it. Uh, always important is the governance structure, what are the voting rights, uh, in which groups of members or voting rights uh, vested, the board of directors, the structure, what types of issues will the board uh, be involved in versus uh, membership issues. Always important is to focus attention on effective management and uh, supervisory responsibilities, leadership function. And as always, the cooperative model uh, will really succeed when designed to operate efficiently according to market principles with a viable revenue model and uh, stable cash flow. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jason. Uh, the, the first industry and, and uh, entity that we're going to be talking about is a cooperative that was formed here in Denver called the Community Language Cooperative. And this was a group of three ladies, uh, Spanish-speaking ladies here in Denver, who had been working as interpreters um, for various organizations around the Denver metropolitan area. And they wanted to form a business that could get more of their um, uh, friends and colleagues to participate and be business owners. So we worked together with them uh, along with the uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union to create uh, a cooperative business model. And uh, they, they wanted to create this cooperative to uh, obviously to help their community of Spanish language workers, but also to work with other um, uh, people in the, in the community that have specific language needs. What we discussed when we were first chatting about the co-op was whether to create a worker co-op or a co-op that was made up of independent contractors. We went through the pros and cons of these two forms of cooperative businesses. With employees, you have uh, W-2 forms. The co-op would have to be responsible for workers' comp insurance, uh, unemployment insurance, those kinds of things, and, and or do we want to stay as independent contractors where each of the members of the co-op would pay their own taxes, pay for their own insurance, work on their own, uh, work for other uh, organizations besides the co-op? The co-op ended up becoming an uh, independent contractor co-op, uh, but they think of themselves sort of as, as employees. Uh, on the other hand, it's essentially a marketing cooperative. Uh, the co-op is, is, was formed to help their various members find clients, uh, assist with scheduling and bookkeeping, and market the services of all, of all the members. Uh, the co-op started off with just Span Spanish-speaking, uh, Spanish-language uh, interpreters, and they've moved on to, uh, I think they have a Vietnamese interpreter, they may have a Russian interpreter, they have an interpreter that works with uh, uh, the Bantu uh, African language, 
and it's really uh, it's really expanding and doing quite well. And for more information, as it shows on the slide, you can you can check out their website. Jason, Next slide, please. Well, this is an exciting new area in cooperative uh, development. The quote unquote sharing economy has spawned all kinds of really interesting uh, companies and technological platforms. And as we see innovation in this space evolve, it's even more exciting to see uh, platform ownership be distributed among the primary users and producers on those sites, on those uh, services. So two examples here. Uh, one is a relatively new startup called Ethical Bay. And it's designed to be a cooperatively owned marketplace for artisanal products that are filtered and, and screened based on ethical uh, sustainability practices. And it's, you could think of it as a cooperatively owned eBay site for independent producers and like-minded consumers. Another one is a client of mine. Uh, they're called Members Media. And this is uh, the cooperatively owned YouTube uh, version of uh, independent media content where users, producers, collaborators will all come together to produce cooperative content uh, and will own the channel, the platform by which that content is disseminated. Uh, in this case, there was uh, we did lengthy analysis on the class structure and ultimately created a multi-stakeholder architecture with multiple membership classes. There's a consumer and subscriber class that's you, me, and, and everyone else who consumes content. Uh, there's a worker, contractor, freelancer class which will uh, be involved in the production and support and collaboration to create great content. And important in any creative endeavor is the producer uh, and creator class, those who are organizing and ultimately uh, completing projects that they'll deliver to the market. What's really exciting about the multi-stakeholder uh, cooperative space is the potential for investor members to come in, have limited voting rights, and help scale uh, the cooperative model uh, in accordance with the cooperative principles, with majority member, patron owner control, and the majority of allocated net earnings going to patron members. Again, there was um, some analysis on one class versus multi-class. And what we had to think about were the different value transactions that were taking place in the cooperative ecosystem and decided it was uh, cleanest and simplest to do it through multiple classes. As well, we looked at how do you measure patronage activity uh, by different contributors or consumers in the cooperative and has to devise elegant formula to measure patronage. And with any sort of economic transaction, we had to find ways to appropriately measure and balance risk and reward. And what we found here were, was that the multiple membership classes each had a different profile of risk and reward. And to structure them as separate classes really took into account the holistic value proposition for um, each sector in the, in the cooperative. Uh, so this is a really exciting project, and I think we're going to see many more cooperatively owned platforms like it. Back to you, Linda. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jason. Uh, this next cooperative, uh, not many people, when they think about meditation, um, think about uh, putting a group of meditators together to form a cooperative. But that's exactly what happened uh, in this situation. This was a, a, a woman who owned a meditation company for several years. And her regular customers were very invested in her, in her business. And she wanted to share. Uh, that business and she came to me to uh, talk about how to form a cooperative. Uh, this particular person, her name is Sierra McNamara, uh, was uh, totally fascinated with the co-op structure and became a self-taught person. She went and read multiple books 
Uh, she read uh, articles. She talked to people around the country on different types of co-ops. And then she came to me. And she learned about the differences of running a business as a sole proprietor versus having multiple owners, um, who's going to be on the board of directors, uh, could she remain on the board of directors, uh, is she giving up all control. Uh, all of those issues were discussed prior to her forming the co-op. Uh, then we looked at different classes of membership for this meditation group. Uh, we have just a few employees that um, ran the, the actual operations of the business, but there were also instructors and then the consumers, her regular customers. So it became a full community involvement type of cooperative. And uh, one of the big issues was governance, who makes the decisions uh, for this kind of multi-stakeholder co-op, and how the money flows. So. How do you give value to all the members, to the employees, to the instructors, to your regular customers who become members? And, and she set up a different, uh, different classes with different benefits and different rights to each class. Uh, some had voting rights. Some did not have voting rights. Uh, luckily, here in Colorado, we have a, a wonderful uh, set of statutes that allow us to form these very, very flexible co-ops. And this was one of them. And the uh, Mayu Sanctuary, the Mayu Meditation Cooperative, started in January 1 of this year. And they currently have over 200 members. So they're doing quite well. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Linda. Uh, under the same rubric of a multi-stakeholder co-op, um, we have found, and, and it turns out most of the examples we're giving uh, have some basis in Colorado forms cooperatives, but you should know these can be formed in many, many states. Uh, we've found in our experience that Colorado tends to have a flexible suite of cooperative statutes, and our new, fairly new, uh, limited cooperative association act uh, is really exciting and, and provides opportunities for many of these new models to emerge. Uh, and this example, the Venture Accelerator Incubator, uh, that is perhaps an intimidating name for a group that comes together to help build new businesses or build new organizations. Uh, this example is in, this, in the nonprofit and social enterprise space, but this is a group, an ecosystem, a number of stakeholders who have come together uh, to see a need to build new social enterprises with solid business models and uh, dedicated mentorship and access to capital to develop, start, and hopefully grow uh, new, new types of companies and new types of, of uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, so the model is to incubate these businesses with uh, an ecosystem of support. Again, we're looking at a multi-stakeholder cooperative architecture to take into account the multiple ch channels of value and the multiple um, pieces of the puzzle that are required to build this ecosystem. And so this is by way of example, but one of those value, value transactions is the entrepreneur, him or herself, uh, or the venture. This is the group that may be thought of as the consumer. In, in this type of model. They come to the cooperative for uh, perhaps it's a curriculum, uh, maybe it's you know, an accelerated MBA, or it's uh, a series of lessons on uh, finance or business plan writing, what have you. Another group might be the consultants, coaches, mentors. These might be thought of as a producer class, which are delivering services or providing value through the cooperative to the consumer class. Um, as with any business, organization is key, and sometimes uh, the folks who don't get enough uh, gratitude and thanks are the back office team that are providing the organization, the administrative staff, the marketing, an executive director, perhaps uh, some operational individuals who are really putting all of this together and, and making sure that the machine works efficiently. Another uh, potential class would be the professionals or technical service providers. These might be folks 
who uh, provide niche services or have a particular area of expertise to uh, interact with the different uh, ventures that come through. Again, there's a potential for this type of cooperative to require capital to grow and to operate, and it might do so either by giving voting rights under a limited cooperative association or uh, through some other funding mechanisms, whether that's foundation support or non-voting uh, shares. But either way, there's multiple, there's a flexible, uh, there's a flexible option and multiple ways to uh, like this pie up. Again, you have to look at the different value transactions, uh, the different patronage activities, how would you measure and return some uh, proceeds of the cooperative's business to the different membership classes, taking into account the different uh, channels of, of risk and reward. So this one is not yet formed and is really still being conceived, uh, but provides an interesting template for uh, creative thought and how we can leverage cooperative principles to build an ecosystem. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jason. Uh, this next industry is for uh, those of our listeners out there who are working with uh, disadvantaged persons and or with nonprofits that work with disadvantaged persons. Um, I got the opportunity last year to form a cooperative here in Denver called Hearts and Hands Cooperative. And uh, uh, the woman, um, Shana Riley, came to me and, and asked me about uh, how her group of participants in her nonprofit work enrichment program could earn uh, some income through a cooperative format uh, for these for these folks. And we did a lot of studying and talking back and forth. We talked to several different CPAs, um, uh, co-op CPAs in in determining how, how an organization could be formed that would be a sister organization to a nonprofit so that the participants in the co-op uh, were essentially the same participants that were in the nonprofit. And, and we came up with the Hearts and Hands Co-op. And what this is is a marketing cooperative for physically and mentally disadvantaged people and they sell products that they are making through the nonprofit. And these products are things like uh, bracelets and dog biscuits and things that they can take to uh, county fairs or neighborhood fairs. And uh, the members of the co-op actually participate in those sales efforts. Um, the nonprofit staff help with uh, training and help with the actual manufacture of the products. And um, Shana wanted to create um, this entity and this co-op not just for financial purposes, because uh, these folks uh, don't need the financial resources of being a business owner, but it was mostly to provide autonomy, um, pride, uh, a very small amount of income, uh, and give them a sense of ownership, give them a sense of being in the community rather than just on the sidelines of the community. Uh, it took a long time to come up with uh, proper bylaws for this organization. Uh, we limited membership uh, in the co-op to participants in the nonprofit. Uh, some of the members uh, were not able to be represented, uh, were not able to represent themselves. So they are represented at the co-op level on the board of directors uh, by a caregiver or a member representative. However, all of the members, because there are only 10 or 15, I think, are on the board of directors. So everybody participates in governance. Everybody participates in making decisions. And um, I've talked to Shana recently, and she said they've done a they've, the members of the co-op and the members of the community um, are thrilled with the whole concept of being a business owner. Uh, they can go to their family members and say, I am a business owner. And it's, and it's really touched uh, a strong nerve in the community. So just to give you an idea of, of another type of co-op that can be formed. Next slide. Thanks, Linda. 
This next example uh, really demonstrates how innovation sometimes comes in, in waves. And it turns out that uh, there's a newfound uh, movement of small mom and pop uh, ski operation, uh, ski mountain owners uh, here in Colorado that have been defunct for a long time and are really looking to make a comeback, but uh, it's tough to compete against the relatively large ski operation owners, Bell Resorts, uh, the bigger operations that own uh, numerous mountains and, and ski resorts around the country. And yet there exists a 40 or more year old model of ski mountain cooperatives uh, to aggregate uh, in interested, uh, like-minded individuals to come together for a common purpose and achieve some common objective and uh, help to uh, bring scale to to that to that vision. I had the good fortune uh, several weeks back of visiting the Mad River Glen Cooperative. It's in rural Vermont, uh, not far from Sugarbush, and it's about a 25 or 30 year old uh, skier owned cooperative that uh, operates a really beautiful resort. Um, it's been in existence, like I said, continuously for 30 or so years. Uh, another example is out in California. It's called the Bear Valley Mountain Cooperative. This one is more of an HOA or a homeowners association that's come together to buy rights for uh, an exclusive ski resort. It's relatively small, uh, whereas the Mad River Glen Cooperative has several hundred members and uh, the vibrant uh, ski resort in, in Vermont, a little more than an hour away from, from Burlington. Um, here, what you're looking at is an architecture uh, around what, what are the needs of the community, what are the desires of potential patrons. Uh, in this case, perhaps uh, as in Mad River Glen, it's a skier consumer-owned cooperative where the skiers are looking for access to a mountain perhaps in a, in a location and with uh, certain um, features that are uh, that would be difficult to find elsewhere at a cost that they can afford and that they have some control over. Uh, and what you're looking at in terms of building out the, the business model of the cooperative is to really look at what are the revenues. What does it take to build uh, the mountain to meet the needs of the community at a price point that people can afford and are willing uh, to buy into. When we think of skier ownership, this is more than just buying a ski pass. This is buying an ownership stake in the underlying assets and vision of the common enterprise. So we've really got to do some math to make sure that it works and we can pay for staff to run the ski lift, that we can pay to build uh, the ski lift and, and run uh, the mountain with a healthy budget for operations and maintenance. So you're looking at what types of assets need to be purchased. What are the ongoing operation costs? Um, what is the? What are some other purposes for which the cooperative might be organized? And in Mad River Glen, sustainability and conservation are central to their mission. It's really uh, baked into their bylaws, and it's a pervasive part of their cooperative, and so uh, you can see it in the faces and the, uh, the faces of the members. You can see it at the resort itself, and um, this would be a really interesting and exciting thing to, to see, and, and what's emerging is the potential for individually owned mom and pop mountain, ski mountains to come together through some sort of cooperative. Maybe it's a purchasing cooperative of ski mountain owners, uh, again, to achieve some uh, economies of scale. Uh, but these are two examples that have been in existence for uh, several decades and are giving rise to new visions of cooperative ownership. With that, I'll turn it back to Linda. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jason. Um, before we go uh, a little bit further, um, I wanted to remind everyone that if you have questions that you would like to ask us, or if you would like to share a story about uh, a co-op in an industry that uh, we're not discussing today, uh, please send something uh, in, uh, write something to our organizers, and uh, at the end of our slide presentation, we'll be happy to answer your questions. 
Now, uh, this next slide has to do with uh, a co-op that has not been formed, um, but it was an idea that was created um, a couple of years ago uh, with uh, a group of folks from the Rocky Mountain Employee Ownership Center and myself. And it was basically, how do you take um, a small community newspaper, say a neighborhood newspaper, in the Denver metropolitan area, for example, there's quite a few small neighborhood newspapers uh, in sort of suburb type newspapers, and uh, transition that kind of uh, paper to a community-owned organization. And the particular instance that we were working on, the owner of the community newspaper was retiring and had been operating the newspaper for many, many, many years and um, wanted to either sell the business or just retire. So we talked to him about forming uh, a community cooperative that would be a multiple stakeholder co-op with multiple classes of membership um, so that the whole community would be involved in this, in this publication. Uh, this was a monthly publication. Uh, some some community newspapers are weekly publications, but this one was a monthly. Uh, obviously, you're going to have a, a limited geographic area. Um, your advertising is going to be limited to people that uh, are in the area. Your readership is, is very community-based. And so uh, besides looking at the business model and how to make it a viable entity, an ongoing entity, um, how, to, how do you create that community ownership? So we came up with different classes of ownership. Obviously, the employees, you've got your writers, your editors, your photographers, uh, those folks, uh, your salespeople that are out selling advertising. Uh, then you had, we had a, a class uh, that we called the advertising or the business class. And those were generally community businesses. Um, there are some advertisers from outside the community, but mostly they were community, local, small businesses um, from uh, restaurants to uh, local uh, accounting offices to hairdressers, all, the, all your local businesses that advertise, plus your contractors, um, your real estate people. Those could all definitely be a class of membership. And then uh, the community itself. Do you want to add uh, other, other classes of membership? Do you want local government? Do you want residents to be involved? Uh, do you want um, uh, independent contractors, such as authors and photographers? Uh, many, many decisions would have to be made regarding who is going to operate or operate the business, and then who is going to govern. You can have a board of directors that hires the editor, editorial staff and the, and the company uh, uh, employees, uh, and the board of directors just makes policy decisions. Or you can have a very hands-on type of board of directors that gets involved in the operations of the entity. So uh, who has voting rights for issues such as uh, editorial content? Does the board of directors have the right to do that, or do they leave that up to the editor? Uh, those are decisions that would have to be made. Who decides what? Who, who is going to uh, decide what advertising rates are? Who's going to decide uh, what, um, how, how far out geographically they want to spread this newspaper or, or participate? And, and how much of the community can realistically be expected to be involved. Uh, so it's an interesting conversation, and this is thrown out to all of you as just another idea for a cooperative concept where you want to create a community uh, publication. Thank you. Next slide. Well, by now, hopefully, um, wheels are turning, and you all are coming up with ideas of, of how this model is is flexible and, and what other applications there are. Uh, that's the, the idea here is these, this is just a taste test of, of what's out there, uh, but the potential is, is enormous and really the sky is the limit. This next example, um, I had a fun one with, I had a fun time with this. Uh, I was out in Portland, Oregon last week and uh, really tried to 
focus whatever amount of uh, business I had with taxi cabs on driver-owned uh, cooperative cab companies. So the ride I took from uh, Portland Airport was with Radio Cab, which uh, has been driver-owned for more than 50 years. And um, as you'd expect, Portland is a, is a very friendly uh, community for uh, cooperatives and for small business. Uh, but it turns out that the model exists in cities all across the country. Um, Denver is home to no fewer than two cooperatively owned taxi cab companies, Union Taxi and Green Taxi Co-op. Madison, Wisconsin has Union Cab. Uh, as I mentioned, Portland has Radio Cab, Union Cab. And what's exciting is, again, uh, in contrast to the examples that have bloomed out of the sharing economy, there exists this model that's been in existence for decades that shares not just transportation services, but shares platform ownership among the people who deliver value to the community, namely the drivers themselves, and gives them some control over the terms of their um, existence and services and some control over the brand um, by which they operate. So these are generally contractor or freelance cooperatives where the drivers are uh, independently operated uh, 1099 um, contractors. The cooperative generally provides some marketing uh, for the driver, so you probably consider these marketing cooperatives. Um, the revenue model is generally to pay some degree of dues, a membership fee upon uh, admission, and then uh, some level of dues to cover, again, administrative functions, uh, back office uh, support, any licensing, any sort of uh, fees or costs associated with acquiring and maintaining a regulatory uh, permission to operate. Uh, and what we're seeing more of is the use of technology. It's exciting that Union Taxi in Denver has developed its own app uh, that functions a lot like Uber's app, but rather than hail uh, an Uber, you're hailing uh, a taxi ride from a driver who owns part of the business and owns part of the service that he or she provides to the community um, and the potential for federating or associating these individual community-rooted taxi cooperatives is really exciting uh, to provide some scale through joint efforts and communication, collaboration. Uh, these are all independently owned cooperatives in Denver, Madison, Portland, uh, but putting them together to create some common uh, core of values and some common brand or uh, degree of support is is where there's a lot of potential for uh, system-wide change. So this one's a fun one, and if you do live in a city that has a cooperatively owned taxi company, I encourage you to uh, use it as much as possible for any of your needs. And if there isn't one, uh, this is a great example of, of a relatively easy upstart cooperative. Um, with that, next slide, and back over to Linda. Thank you, Jason. Uh, one of the reasons Jason and I put together this this group of slides in this in this presentation was that um, looking at co-op development and the co-op industry in general around the country, um, we were getting concerned that that folks were looking at specific industries and and there was a concentration of co-op development in certain industries and not enough in co-op development of all different kinds of industries. For example, um, the food industry throughout the country has a great deal of work being done with cooperatives. Uh, there are agricultural cooperatives, there are farm cooperatives, there are organic grocery cooperatives, there are plain grocery store cooperatives. Um, this slide is to show another type of food industry cooperative that is a possibility. and and uh, I'm sure there are some uh, restaurant co-ops around the country. Uh, we don't have any here in Colorado, but I sure would like to form one. And how I would go about looking at a restaurant co-op would be to uh, determine who are going to be the owners of this entity. Traditionally, you've got a restaurant that is owned by uh, a family or owned by one or two people, a couple of partners, and they hire all the employees, and the employees come and go 
and uh, don't have much say in the operation of the business. Uh, you might have some regular customers, um, or you might have no regular customers at all. Then you have your vendors. Um, and so in looking at a, how an, a restaurant operates, could this be converted into a co-op or become a co-op uh, from the ground up? And the suggestion is that you look at a multi-stakeholder co-op so that you have the employees, all of the employees, um, from top management down to the dishwashers, as uh, part of the co-op. Uh, you can have part-time or full-time. You can have restrictions on you know, when, when an employee uh, is invited to join the co-op. Um, all the traditional worker co-op uh, uh, maxims you would need to use to create that particular class of membership. Then your customer class, uh, you could have an annual fee, you could have a one-time fee, so that they are, they are members of the co-op. Maybe they get a discount for being regular customers. Or uh, with an annual fee, maybe they get uh, a special meal once a year that's completely paid for by the co-op so that they can bring their family in and have a special dinner. Uh, there's many, many ideas, and, and, and this slide is meant to just generate more ideas. Then you have your vendors. Um, if you have a restaurant with a, with a liquor license, do you want some of your liquor vendors to be members? Do you want your, if you're serving only, only organic food, do you want to participate with organic farms in your local area so the food is local um, and is organically grown and you can market that to uh, the community. Uh, the governance issues in a restaurant co-op would be uh, slightly more difficult. Uh, there's going to be an inherent conflict between uh, the employees and the consumers. Uh, the, the customers are going to want low prices uh, to get the food that they want at the quality that they want at the price that they want. The employees, on the other hand, are going to want uh, a good wage, a living wage. So, you know, who makes those kinds of decisions? Uh, what would vendors have to say in, in the operations of the co-op? Maybe they are members of the co-op but not voting members. Uh, those are all decisions that would need to be looked at based on the particular business model um, that you and your group of people are developing. And part of this whole discussion is, is looking at that business model looking at, OK, who are we? What do we want to do? What are our goals? And how can we achieve that using the co-op as a business model? And Jason and I firmly believe that the co-op as a business model can be used in almost any industry. Next slide, please. Well, thank you, Linda. At this point, you know, we've opened up just a small window into the potential for applying the principles, the values, the concepts of the cooperative business model to a few industries, but you can form a co-op in just about any industry. And as Linda was speaking, it made me think, where else do we get to have these discussions around the vision of the business that we want to be a part of, to shop at, to run, where else do we get to decide on what the fair wage and fair price for the products that we're buying? We can have those conversations when we're more intimately involved in our economic transactions as a worker owning our labor, as a purchaser owning our consumption choices, as a producer owning the value of our goods. And when we engage in more thoughtful and deeper discussions through those economic transactions, there's a real opportunity. Uh, and the most important part of that is to really transform ownership. So we encourage you to look at these industries, look at these categories, look at entrepreneurship in your community, look at the existing businesses, and think about the potential for uh, user-owned cooperatives as a next step or as the future of, of any of those concepts. Uh, and with that, we wanted to turn it over for your questions and your ideas. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to NCBA Prusa for hosting, and to you all for participating. This has been a lot of fun for us.
So absolutely. Um, there's a, there's some great conversation, some insight there. Um, we do have quite a few questions. Um, it looks like we have about 15 minutes or so to kind of get through some of these. Um, first question, uh, easy that we can answer, is uh, we, we will make the slides available for printing, as long as that's OK with uh, Jason and uh, Linda. We can happily email those to the um, to the participants. Um, there's there were two questions. Well, first was a comment about the Minnesota 308B uh, piece that you guys were talking about. Um, what are your thoughts, Jason and Linda, on on C co-ops versus the 308B uh, co-ops that are similar to LLCs? Um, that comes from Robert. Um, is that Am I asking that question correctly? I think so. I think you're talking about limited cooperative associations versus corporate co-ops. Jason, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, I'll take an initial stab at least. So my understanding of the question is the traditional co-op is generally thought of as a patron-only cooperative. In other words, voting rights and allocations of net earnings can only be made to uh, patron members, user members, producer members, uh, and uh, on the basis of, of patronage. The limited cooperative association, uh, there are six states that have adopted the Uniform Limited Cooperative Association Act, and it provides for a balance of patron member ownership and investor member ownership. Uh, without getting too detailed, those voting rights are limited and constrained to enable uh, patron member control and patron member uh, they get to receive the majority of allocated net earnings. So it's, uh, it's considered a hybrid form of cooperative uh, with access to potentially a larger pool of investor capital. Then did you, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think um, the Minnesota statute is not quite based on uh, the Limited Cooperative Association Act. It's slightly different, but it's quite similar. Uh, and as far as I know, um, the uh, patron members, what you're calling the patron members or the regular members of the co-op, always have the majority voting rights and the majority uh, control uh, of those kinds of entities. And the reason that ALCA was formed originally was because co-ops were having a hard time finding funding. And in this manner, they can find investors who may or may not have voting rights, depending on how you set up the co-op. You don't have to give them voting rights. And, uh, and the investors can be brought in and have uh, a little say of what's going on, but not total control of the co-op. And this allows for additional funding for, for new co-ops. Next question. Sure. Um, so there was a two, two comments about the uh, accelerator and incubator idea. Um, Anne wanted to know, uh, are there examples of this in action, or is it is it just theoretical? Um, and then uh, another question came in um, about who would be eligible to join these accelerators and incubators. Uh, would it be you know, law firms and, and nonprofits, or just kind of um, other, I guess, Freelance, they, they call them freelancer independent nonprofits. Well, I'll take the second part of that question first. Um, eligibility will be determined by the incubator itself, and we're seeing more and more of these pop up uh, all over the place. You know, lots of co working spaces act as incubators in one way or another, uh, so it really depends on a particular model or the particular incubator. Um, to answer the first question, my example was based on what is currently in concept only. I'm not aware of an operating incubator that's organized as a cooperative, at least not in this way. Um, I believe that there are more and more um, incubators focused on the art, on music, on uh, independent content, and always interesting, and I think the question should always be asked, who owns the underlying uh, assets or the underlying business 
of the incubator. Uh, who are the funders? Who are the uh, who owns the brand associated with that incubator? Uh, the one that I base my, my example off of is currently in concept, but has garnered quite a bit of excitement and attention um, in a community here. And uh, there are other examples. I think that we're going to see many more limited cooperative associations start with some element of incubator uh, around it in order to kind of bring together the initial founders. I think as we think of cooperatives that are looking to scale, uh, investors are going to want to see that there's a solid founding team. And in order to deliver content and value through a cooperative, uh, we need to kind of get the machine churning. So that will require some amount of incubation, uh, both metaphorically and then in terms of actual structure. So unfortunately, I can't point to any examples and give you any, any websites, but uh, keep, uh, keep in contact. My our contact information uh, will be made available. And I welcome any inquiries. And, uh, and if you know of any or if you come across any, I would love to hear about them. Great. Um, we have a few more questions. If we have some time here. Um, two, two questions, kind of similar, but just about different topics. Um, have Have you guys ever heard? I think it was Linda that was talking about restaurant co-ops. Have you heard of any snack food co-ops? Um, and then, do either of you have any experience with daycare uh, co-ops? Um, they were just curious about the single class, multi-class structure of, of daycare co-ops. So kind of two separate questions, but in the same have you heard of realm. So I'll leave that open to Jason and Linda to answer. Um, this is Linda. Uh, I uh, I have heard of people that would like to start daycare co-ops. Um, uh, I think it is going to be a similar situation as you would have with the uh, interpreter co-ops that I talked about originally, where you have a group of daycare providers um, that form an organization that market their services. However, you have to be careful with uh, various states have different uh, statutes and regulations regarding who can provide daycare, the type of licensing that's required, that kind of thing. So I'd be a little cautious about that. Uh, a snack food co-op, I'm not quite sure uh, what that would entail. So if they could, uh, is there any way we can unmute that person and have them ask the question a little more directly? Um, I think if, if we could, we can obviously position that. Um, or maybe later the, on. The webinar. At the yeah. end. Okay. Yeah, we'll have that Great. person email. email and yeah, have them email and, me and I'll, and I'll get, get some more information. Sure. And what's, what's interesting here is, um, and I'm thinking that we could, we could do this, is that um, there's so many great questions. I'm wondering if, if we might pose these to the, the panel and, and have you guys answer them, and then we could kind of respond back to you know, every question in some way, shape, or form. I don't know what the timing on that would be, but there's some, some great questions that we're just unfortunately not going to be able to get to. Um, and they also Well, we've got important. about five more minutes, so I think we can answer one or two more, I think. OK. Um, so let's see here. Um, for the co-op for disadvantaged persons, um, what was the financial relationship between the co-op and the nonprofit? I think the core of the question was, is the nonprofit receiving revenue from what the co-op is generating? This is Linda. No, uh, no, it was not. Um, the, the nonprofit receives funding from the state for these programs. They're called, called uh, work enrichment or job training programs for disadvantaged persons. And uh, the co-op receives uh, um, the co-op itself um, gets money from the marketing efforts of its of its uh, employee members. Great. Um, there's a couple questions about um, multiple uh, class and multiple stakeholder structures. Um, how do you incorporate in the bylaws principle five about education and information? Um, for members when you have a, a widely diverse multi-stakeholder model. And kind of to play off that, we had a question come in about 
you know, how are you deciding between a single or multiple stakeholder structure? Um, single, the, the question, the person asking the question said, single often seems more straightforward to me. When is it worth having multiple classes? Go ahead, Jason. Jason. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, it, it's often a very complex question, and I think one that requires uh, quite a bit of discussion with the steering committee or the founding uh, members. In generally, you're looking at the equities between members and how they're participating in a cooperative, and ultimately how their patronage or their usage of the cooperative would, will be measured for purposes of patronage, refunds, or dividends. And that latter part of the question really helps to bring clarity to whether one class of membership or multiple classes of membership is more fitting. And the degree to which different members will participate differently according to different formula, uh, that will speak to and, and probably lead to the conclusion that multiple classes of membership is more fitting. Uh, the first part of the question about principle five is really interesting. and. That is one where, at least in, in a six-class six cooperative uh, that I recently incorporated, we made education a central function of the cooperative itself. And the cooperative, part of the value proposition of becoming a member was to be part of this rich ecosystem, this rich community of, of engagement and collaboration and education. And we found that in order to maximize the value brought to and consumed from the cooperative, there had to be some community element where people could exchange ideas, could give feedback, and education uh, needed to be harnessed and, and um, filtered through the cooperative as a way of bringing value to each of the members. So that became a very central part of the value proposition of the cooperative, and, and then we, were turned around and translated to different roles and responsibilities for each of the membership classes. That actually, in many ways, became uh, one of the elements of being a member in the cooperative in good standing was the degree and, and ways in which you participated in uh, education in and among the cooperative. Great question. And I would like to say ditto to Jason's comments and, and add that uh, it's definitely easier to do a, a one-class cooperative. Um, I, I laughed when I heard that because I thought, yeah, let's do lots of those. Um, but it all depends on the business model. It all depends on the goals of the people that are organizing the co-op. Um, do they want to include other members of the community or not? Uh, if they do, then you think about other classes. If they don't, if they want to focus on um, building a core business, uh, around one class of membership, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and maybe adding other community members uh, later on in the in the life of the business. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, we do have a lot a lot of them coming in. Um, can you, uh, Jason, and Linda, talk about any cooperative failures that legal professionals might learn from? Um, <laughs> and one of the examples was, you know, whether the bylaws or operating agreements were not articulated in a, in a way that members could engage or follow, or some other, you know, legal architecture was found to not work. Is, it, is there any failures that you can kind of allude to that people could learn from? This is Linda. Um, the failures that I'm familiar with are not so much due to the formation in the bylaws of the organization, but either one, the business model was not, it's, it's like the failure of any business. The business model um, that was not correct and or the expectations were too high and or uh, the management was not appropriate. Um, but it wasn't based on uh, whether or not it was a co-op. Or whether or not it was, it was, it was almost all based on the business itself. Jason. Yeah, I would echo and say that the same principles of uh, financial discipline, a viable revenue model, a viable business plan, 
those things absolutely have to be intact. Um, I can't think of an example, but I would characterize uh, a set of bylaws that collect dust on the shelves would, in my mind, be a failure uh, because it doesn't provide, uh, a gr it doesn't ground the day-to-day uh, -day operations of the cooperative. It doesn't speak to the members. So I think the organizational documents need to reflect not just the values and vision, but also the mechanical operation of the cooperative. They need to become a breathing, living document uh, that ordinary members can access, can understand, uh, can interpret, and apply in real life. Otherwise, um, we haven't done much to transform business. So um, with that, I can't think of any examples, but we should be absolutely learning from mistakes as much as uh, trying to avoid them in the future. Great. And I have one question for you guys, uh, and it was reflected in one of the questions here, and then we'll close, and it should be pretty quick to answer. Um, it, in general, how much should a startup budget for figuring out their legal structure on the front end? Um, <laughs> is, there, is, there a, is there a figure that you guys can put out there that the folks that are still on the line here might, might, uh, might have? No. <laughs> I, I will answer the question. I think uh, you know the, the the starting budget is a tough one. I think it goes back to the last question about the the business model, and uh, we can learn a lot from the kind of tech based startup world in terms of uh, looking at your budget and giving you a runway to develop and bring to market a viable product. Um, but more importantly, we want to do that in a sustainable way. So you know, the whole notion of lean startup, I think, is really missing a lot of fundamental uh, values that we in the cooperative community should be keeping front and center, which is if we're seeking to provide quality jobs uh, at fair living wages, then we need to budget for that. Um, but I would say that key to any startup is having a team that works well together, that's committed to the long haul. Um, that can accomplish so much that one person with a big bank account cannot. And the budget will vary depending on many factors, but the synergy and commitment of the founding team is, is vital. Uh, and so is the willingness to get deep into the development process. And I like nothing more than when a client is weeding through the, uh, the real details of the bylaws and organic documents it shows, you know, really the the, uh, the diligence and interest, uh, but also a real appreciation, understanding of what it's going to take to launch a successful cooperative. Great. Well, I want to thank our panel. Uh, you've gotten a lot of compliments, uh, also in the uh, the chat boxes from our um, from our our attendees. Um, I think that uh, if, if there's opportunities to answer some of the some of these questions, um, we might uh, we might think about setting up a follow-up webinar or might do something you know, via text uh, um, and then send out through email. Which there's there's a lot of a lot of energy and interest around this topic. Um, so again, thank you, Jason and Linda. Uh, virtual round of applause to you guys for a very informative session today. Um, we did mention that this has been recorded, um, and everyone that has attended will receive a link to the recording in the next few days. Um, if you're looking for more information about the Co-op Professionals group, you can contact uh, me, Brian Munson. Uh, you can email me at bmunson, that's M-U-N-S-O-N, at ncba.coop. Um, and a little plug, any of you guys out there that are looking for .coop, a big part of co-op identity, so let me know about that as well. Um, I'll be happy to send you additional details on this webinar and, and any of our upcoming uh, events, especially the Co-op Professionals Conference. Uh, it'll be a great, uh, great learning opportunity for a lot of you out there. Um, you can always stay in the loop by checking our website, ncba.coop, where you can subscribe to our Cooperative Business Journal. Uh, it's been my pleasure to moderate this webinar today, and again, thank you all for your time, for Jason and Linda, for their uh, expertise. And uh, we hope to see all of you again at some point soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.